Does that make sense? Yeah. You know where we're going on this? I know. What, yeah. Like the, yeah. <laughs> it's like a promo. Yes. So uh, whenever you're ready or if you have any questions or you want to take a practice run at it or whenever you're ready, hit it. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Hi, this is Melissa Ronda from thehonestway.com, and you are listening to Vroom Vroom Veer. Oh, shit. I forgot to say your name at the end. <laughs> that's perfect. Oh, that's awesome. I love Should the I say O'Shea. say it again? Yeah, sure. Go for it. <laughs> I love the O'Shea. You got to keep it in. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. Tell me it one more time. Just You, you had with, everything perfect. Except for say with Jeff Smith. Yeah, and which you don't really have to do. So I don't really care. Okay. <laughs> well, we'll do one more to okay. see if it's, Just to make I you feel swear, good. less than. For, for, your, for your emotional health, you can do it yeah. one more time. Okay. Yeah. Hi, this is Melissa Ronda from thehonestway.com. And you are listening to Vroom Vroom Beer with Jeff Smith. Well done, ma'am. Thank you All very right. much. And I called you ma'am. That that makes you seem so old. Sorry. I okay. <laughs> no, you're not. Okay. I'm going to hit stop. I'll be right back. Are you ready to thoughtfully steer away from your revved up, frenzied, and far too often scripted life? Then welcome to Vroom Vroom Veer with Jeff Smith where he guides you down the road differently traveled by sharing unique experiences with guests who have managed to shift away from a life stuck on cruise control and veered their way into a more authentic and fulfilling one in all sorts of interesting and kind of remarkable ways. Get ready to vroom vroom veer with your differently traveled road chauffeur, Jeff Smith. Tim Laskis. Thank you so much for being on Vroom Vroom Beer and welcome to the show. How's it going? Hey, Jeff. Thanks for having you, uh, having me, actually. Um, <laughs> it's me going too. great here <laughs> in sunny South Carolina. Yeah, it's, South Carolina is kind of popular these days. It's it's big on the uh, entrepreneur uh, like radar, right, for startup growth and things like that. Yeah, and I, I think even more Myrtle Beach. Everybody loves going to the beach. Okay. So Yeah, it's kind of hurricane country, but other than that, it's awesome. <laughs> oh yeah, uh, we don't have too many issues, but uh, every now and then we get a scare. But yeah, it's really not not that bad. It's, not too it's bad. great being here, and it, it's a good location because we're not too far from the mountains and not too far from the beach. Awesome. The closest I've ever lived to South Carolina was uh, the Panama City, Florida area, mm. and that's pretty far away. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty far. That's pretty far that's away. Beautiful area. Beautiful yeah, it is. Gulf, yes, Gulf yes, beaches. the Gulf Coast. Correct. Uh, anyway, so you are at coachwherever.com. So talk a little bit about what you got going on over there in your business. Yeah, for sure. Well, I started out with this, this whole idea of, I've, I've been working as a mental performance coach, uh, with high profile professional athletes in the sport of motocross. motocross. And I had an idea to develop a certificate program to teach other people how to do that. And, um, and so there was just a lot of need. A lot of people were asking for my services and I don't have enough time and, and energy. And so I was turning people away. So I'm like, you know, what? I need to teach other people how to do this. So I developed coach wherever to, as a certificate program for the people who want to become a motocross mental performance coach. Okay. And then within that was last year. And, and then within the last couple of months, I've opened it into a life coaching certificate program and a group coaching program and it's nothing to do with sports. And if, you know, my background is in psychology, which I'm sure we may get into later. Right. Um, I've worked as a therapist, a life coach, a mental performance coach uh, for many years. And so they both kind of are, are very just close to me and, and I love it. And so being able to teach is, is, is really my passion. Okay. That sounds awesome because it's like, I've heard this story so many times now on this show that like when you know you've got a viable business model, I think, when when you're turning people away from who are currently trying to give you money to do something. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> right. So that, I mean, that that's, should be that's the, the, that's you know, the, the bell flag ringer. That goes exactly. Up. Like, hey, right. There's something here. This there's is, a need. There's something here because people keep trying to give me money for my time. I could, I could probably take that money, <laughs> right? <laughs> and it's so hard and you don't to turn have to away, do- but I'm like, okay, after I've done it for a while, and just I'm like, 
because my wife is, is just like, you don't have enough time to take on any more clients or do anything right, else. Right. And I'm like, okay, I need to come up with a solution. You know how, you know, what, what can I do? And, and so that was the idea that I came up with and it's been very successful. And we've had students from the United States and Canada and the United Kingdom. Wow. Very nice. Cool. Well, that sounds like a blast. So, but okay. So that's cool. Cause you're doing what you love and you're hanging out somewhere you want to be. <laughs> you found your own Costa Rica. It's now oh, yeah. South Carolina. <laughs> <laughs> Mine happens to be in Las Vegas, but let's go back in time and figure out how you got here. Okay. So, um, it sounded like you were a completely different person as a high school kid. Oh, and, you, had, you, and, had, you had to take me back that far, Jeff. Uh, that's, sorry. <laughs> oh, that's no, no, the no. show. It's a great story. And I, I think it is. A, I think it's important for people to understand. It, you know, a lot, a lot of people think, well, hey, you have a PhD in clinical psychology. Right. You must right. have always been into academics and very studious and smart. And, right. and that's just farthest from the truth. When I was growing up, I was not someone who really enjoyed studying. I didn't do well in school. Right. If I made a C, I was so happy. Wow. Uh, these and okay. S all right. We're kind of par for the course for me. Okay. And all I did is I, I raced motorcycles at that time. I didn't care about school. Teachers just kind of pushed me through grade after grade. And yeah. I really didn't deserve to graduate. Graduated in the back of my high school class. I mean, literally in the back. And you were already and riding motorcycles at this, at this point. Yeah, I wow. I was right. I'd been riding motorcycles pretty much all my life. And I think I started racing while I was in maybe eighth grade or so. Wow. So I like raced competitive you know, racing. What's that? Competitive style racing, like, like competitive organized motorcycle racing. Wow. Right. My dad and I would travel cow. around the southeastern United States, from Tennessee and North Carolina, Florida, South Carolina. I mean, you name it. We, we were just going all around every weekend almost for many, many years up until my early twenties. Okay. And that was, that was all I cared about, but studying was not something that, that I was good at. And so wow. it was, okay. And, and I had just, you know, I was a failure at everything else. I was pretty good at racing. And, uh, once I had graduated, my dad said, all right, Tim, so what are you going to do now? And, and I said, well, I, I don't know. And he said, well, you better figure it out. Maybe go down to, to, you know, the college or something. Um, and, and, get on a path he said because you're not gonna you know just live you here at home and you just can't do- ride motorcycles and and live in your parents house for the rest of your yeah, life. Exactly. <laughs> well, yeah geez, exactly well geez he should have been saying that while, while you were screwing around on motorcycles anyway uh, i know yeah it never did come up <laughs> after I graduated. Like, all right now what are you doing now right exactly so he said you know when he said college i said college? dad did you ever look at my grades while i was in high school did did you even see where I graduated, what my class rank was? <laughs> I said, what college is going to take me? <laughs> and he was like, well, I don't know, but you better figure it out. So Ouch. I wow. marched down to the local community college and no, signed up for some courses. Yeah. I, I took some classes and I passed a couple. I failed a couple. And I really didn't find my own. And this is really where things turned around. Okay. I took my first introductory psychology course. And for mm. whatever reason, I was intrigued for the first time. I was interested in, in what I was learning. And so we, we took our first exam and I made, I think it was like a C. I didn't fail it, but you know, I was right there in the middle. But for whatever reason, I decided I wanted to do better. And so I went to the instructor and I said, you know, I really enjoy your class. I like the field of psychology. Can you help me to do better on your test? And kind of expecting what I've always been told, you know, well, just just go study and you'll get good grades. Study hard, get good grades. That's what right, I was always told. Right. <laughs> but this was the first person that actually sat down with me. She never told me just study hard and get good grades. She showed me how to study. Oh, wow. I never knew that there was a, yeah, that's a, that's a <laughs> right. moment right there. Right. It right. Where really somebody was. yeah took the time to say, look, this studying thing, it's a thing to do. It's a, like a skill. You kind of have to learn it. Yeah, exactly. There was, there were specific right. skills and strategies involved and she was the first person to sit down and teach me. And so I really paid attention. I took it serious. And so on the next exam that we were going to have, I had all these skills in place. I applied them. 
I took the exam when I turned it in, you know, I thought, well, maybe I did okay, but I wasn't really sure. So the day that we were going to get the exam back, I walked in late and I had to cross in between the instructor and the rest of the students to get to my seat way on the other side of the class. And she had stopped me and she goes, Tim, I want you to tell the class what you did. And I thought, oh, oh, okay. Oh, I'm in trouble now, sure. right? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I'm used to getting in trouble and I couldn't remember. It's like, what kind of bad thing did I do? I don't remember doing anything. Okay. And so before I could say anything, she said, because you have the highest grade in the class on this most recent exam. Wow. I was stunned, Jeff. I thought, <laughs> right? first I thought, Who she the, has me confused. Is she with talking to else. somebody else? Right. <laughs> it cannot be me. It cannot be Tim Laskis. Right. Definitely not me. Sure. And she said, you know, I want you to really tell the class, you know, what, what you did and how you made this happen. And before I could even say a word, there was a young lady that was sitting up in the front of the class. And she says, I've been an honor roll student my entire life, all throughout school, and I can't get an A in this class to save my life. Well, you can imagine what that did. My, I mean, I just kind of had this smirk on my face. I was like, wow, you, you know, my self-esteem, my confidence, Through everything the roof. straight up. I was like, <laughs> e? I got I got a better grade than this young lady who's always been an honor roll student. Wow. You know, I don't even know what honor roll was. <laughs> You know, I've never yeah, been, I, I, I'm with you. That yeah. was just something foreign to me. Sure. Mm -hmm. Wow. So anyway, I took those principles and I applied them to, to other classes that I had. I ended up raising up my grades and in, in, in everything. And I decided, you know, I'm, I'm going to transfer to a, a regular four year university. So mm -hmm. I did another university in South Carolina, but kind of closer to the beach. And so I went there. I started volunteering for a day treatment program uh, for adults who have chronic and persistent mental illness. And so, again, this is a volunteer position. I said, hey, you know, I'd like to do something. And they said, sure, we'll put you in, in charge of doing – I think we play basketball. You can do basketball once a week with these clients. And let me tell you, Jeff, I loved it. It was great. I ended up increasing my days from one to two to three. I was there multiple times a week. I ended up getting, you know, volunteer of the month. Then I got volunteer of the year. Wow. My grades were doing really well at, at the university. And I decided, you know what? I think I want to go on and get a doctorate. Holy this is a crazy idea. You know, yeah. I've never done well. But now I'm on the roll. And so I just rolled the dice and I applied to Rutgers University up in New Jersey. And so not thinking you know, anything would happen. And, and I think they probably made a mistake maybe when they let me in. Because <laughs> I was like, wow, I got in. So I applied, I got in. And I'm like, whoa, I've never really been out of you know, the, the south, southeastern, you know, kind of area of the states. And so now I'm like, OK, I guess I got to go to New Jersey. And so I went up there and Jeff, I just made it happen. Long story short, I graduated with honors on the dean's list. Um, I took another volunteer position up there working for free. That turned into a paid position. And I just I knew I was like, you know, this is my path. You know, I enjoy the field of psychology. I enjoy right, helping right. people. I rolled the dice again to get into a graduate program, a PhD program in clinical psychology. I didn't make it the first year, but the second year I tried again. I did get into the California School of Professional Psychology. Wow. Now, all the way out into the West Coast, closer to, to uh, Nevada, <laughs> where you're at. Right, right. And, and so here it is. I'm flying across the, you know, the, the country, and I'm in this five-year PhD program. Five years. And wow. It, it was just amazing. It was, a, it was the toughest times of my life, but I got through it. Yeah, that's hard. It is. And, and PhD so it just, student is not an easy life. <laughs> yeah, it really is not. <laughs> it's not. It, you it, paid like, I, lots of dues just, there, right? Oh, yes, absolutely. Uh, yeah. But I love telling this story because, you know, not to, to brag or anything, but to tell people, you know what, if you apply yourself, once you find your passion and you apply yourself, right, you can and achieve you, it. And, and you, you learn that, like, all that time you kind of, like, had this sort of, like, identity idea about Tim Laskis, right? Not a good student, right? That was, was your story at that point. Until well, somebody I, told you <laughs> that right? it's, not, it's, not a, it's not you, it's just you don't have a skill. Like called studying, you know, and uh, and you can learn that skill, and then all suddenly. Well, I thought I was a dummy. I <laughs> right, thought I was exactly. An idiot because right. I couldn't just sit in class right. and just have it just you know seep into my brain, and then sure. you well, know come out can, of it. Really? With, well, with I don't know. There's there's some people I think can, but some people can, and yeah, you know, and I was right. looking at those people, and I was comparing myself, and, and and that was the wrong thing to do, you know. Right. And and so you know, and then also you know, one of the things I did when I went to Rutgers is I made it a point to only 
surround myself with people who were doing very well, who were who were on that path right. to success. You weren't hanging because, around with the party and the guys screwing around. Not at all. Now there were times <laughs> people did party, but yeah. but for the I mean our you know, but well, the no, main you, focus I was, think I think yeah, you wanna it's it's I'm not saying don't party in college. But you don't want to be hanging around with the people that are only partying. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Right. Exactly. Right. And I had a lot of fun in high school. I had some great friends. But right. you know what, Jeff? We were all losers. We, right. we were going nowhere in life. Right. And and so I and, and I really saw the writing on the wall. So when I went to you know Rutgers, I decided I'm only going to hang out with you know the people who were serious, who were making good grades, and who were going you know who I thought were going to be successful. And, and it worked. And some people may, you know, look at that and go, oh, well, that's just kind of shallow. But it worked for me. It got me through. And and I made some great friends. No, there's know. there's a lot to be said about, like, um, carefully picking who you spend time with. There's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> it's a very grown up thing to do, I think, you know. Well, you know, when you're growing up and your mother tells you that, you're like, well, you don't know what you're talking about. You know, stay right. away from those kids. They're no good. They're right, in trouble. Right, right, right. Oh. Just, well, then you're uh, depending on how old you are, you're either going to go, oh, OK, or, oh, you're stupid. You know, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> right. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Right. So, OK. So how did you then. So what was your first job after you got your Ph.D.? Was it like yeah. in a clinical scenario? It was. And okay. it, well, it was a position. It was it was kind of a, it was a dream job. For most people, it was something that I had been working towards for many years. Uh, it was a job with the state of California. Um, it was a, a <laughs> right. you know, I was a psychologist for the sure. state. I had a pension. I I had health benefits. I had vacation, sick time. You name it. I mean, I I had I was set up. Right. I had a house, you know, that was fairly new. I had a couple of cars. I had a dog. I was doing well. Okay. And for a couple of years, I had everything that I wanted. And then there was another shift that, right. that took place. We call place. those we call those veers on this show. Yeah, yes. That was my veers veer. or beers, one or the other. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so I had a veer, okay, or a shift or a change. All right. So what's what's this big moment where you're like, okay, there must be something more. Yeah. Well, you know, once I had accomplished one, you know, because I'd been working for so many years with the goal of having a PhD, becoming a psychologist, working in the field, because I loved it. It was my passion. But then once I had it, you know, I was in my early 30s and there was just something missing. I was I was burned out. I was all about giving, giving myself. You know, right. I gave everything of myself to get my doctorate and then I was giving everything of myself to my clients. And I just wasn't happy. I had everything that I wanted. I had my dreams had come true. But there was something missing. There was a void. I was burned out. And I just I didn't know what it was. I didn't know what to do. But luckily, and I have to you know, give credit to my brother, who he used to come out to California every year and we would go surfing. We would take a week off and just surf all along the California coast. And this particular year, and this was in 2005, I believe, he said, let's go somewhere different. Let's go to Costa Rica. And I said, Costa what? I didn't even know what Costa Rica was. I'm like, okay. I don't, I'm like, dude, I don't even speak Spanish. And he said, don't worry. I got us covered. He said, I took it in high school. I can remember a little bit. And I'm like, oh, okay. All right. <laughs> yeah, sure. Okay. So I just took his word for it. I never even knew. I, I mean, I had no interest in Costa Rica before. So we ended up taking this trip to Costa Rica. We went down there. We had rented this four-wheel drive vehicle. It was during the rainy season. And we had – during the rainy season there, it's kind of like clockwork. It doesn't rain all day long. But, you know, you, you wake up in the morning. The sun's up and it's warm. The birds are out. And then around noon, the clouds roll in. It rains for about an hour, hour and a half. Then the clouds roll away. The sun comes back. And then right before it gets dark, the clouds roll in. Same thing every day. Okay, so we're wow. cruising around this four wheel drive. We're out in the jungles because there, when you're getting to the beach, it's not like going to Myrtle Beach where it's, you know, highway leads you to the beach. And then you've got this big strip of hotels and right, right. Okay. condos. Not and, that. <laughs> yeah, not that at all. I okay. mean, it is there where we were, where there was hardly any development. It was all about off roading and you had to have a good four wheel drive vehicle. Wow. We were going to these little small towns and just having a blast. 
And then I went into this one restaurant and I met this young lady and that changed my whole my, my whole life at that point. Wow. <laughs> the girl that changed your life. The lady she changed <laughs> that changed life. your life. Oh, that's yep. awesome. Okay. And that was in 2005 and it was funny because when we met she my brother and I had just walked in and he said, "Tim, I need to go to the restroom. Why don't you, you know, get a table and just wait?" So I did and I'm sitting at this table and I'm looking across at the next table and this beautiful young lady and so I, I don't know what it was. Maybe it was the beer I had before. Um, but I went up <laughs> to her and I started talking to her. I said, hey, my name's Tim. I live in California and I'm going on and on and on. And she looked up at me and she goes, she said something in Spanish. I'm like, oh, oh crap. Yeah. She didn't understand anything I just said. She, she didn't speak any English. Right. And I thought, oh, man, I just um, now I'm a fool. Right. So my brother came back and I said, hey, can you translate, you know, for me and her? And he so he ended up translating. And so, you know, we ha all had dinner together. We went out dancing. We, we had a great time. Um, and it was just, it changed my life. But once we were ready to, you know, to, for the next day, I couldn't find her, you know? And, and so oh, I'm no. like, Oh my God, I need to find this young lady. And so we oh, looked no. everywhere. And the last night that we were in this town, I went back to that same restaurant and she was there. And so I went up to her and, and so my, I grabbed my brother. I'm like, dude, you gotta, you gotta get, you know, her email and I got to give her mine and let's, you know, and so he did. So long story short, we got each other's information. I kept in contact and I flew out to Costa Rica almost every month Wow. for the next, for the rest of the year, for the next six months or so to visit her. And then I had decided that, you know what, this is the person I'm going to be with. This is my neck. This is my room. I, you know, th this is what my, was this missing. This is my, in my beer, life. right? <laughs> right. Okay. So this, this is, this is my big beer, you know? And, yes. And, and, and I was all excited. And then I started telling people, Jeff, you wouldn't believe I thought I was just, you know, I was ready. I was like, yes, I, I need to sit you down. I need to tell you this. Every one of my friends, family and colleagues told me I was an idiot, Jeff. And crazy. They said, what are you doing? <laughs> right. You're throwing You're everything crazy. away. <laughs> Okay. Everything you had worked for all these years, you got a secure job. You just need to sit tight. Yeah. And just wait until retirement and you'll be okay. All you got to do is write it out. Just write it out. Yeah. And I'm thinking, no, I don't know if I got that many years left in me. I don't, you know, what if I don't make it? You know, I don't You're ever right. want to look back and go, what if? And so I said, I'm making the leap. I'm going to quit my job. Wow. I'm going to sell my house, wow. my cars, everything. <laughs> wow. It does not fit into two suitcases, which is pretty much what I did. I sent a couple boxes home to South Carolina, but basically everything was either sold or given away. And in January of 2006, off I went to Costa Rica and it, it was an amazing adventure. So my wife and I, we're still married today and we, we have a son, we have a five-year-old son and one on the way. And Wow. We were married in April of 2006. And so I invited all my friends and family down. And so when they came down, they fell in love, not only with Costa Rica, but they fell in love with my wife. And uh, one of my good friends who told me I was an idiot, you know, when I initially right, told him right. what I was doing, right, right. who didn't support me, told me I was, I was the one that needed the medication, not my clients mm -hmm. that I was <laughs> Right. <laughs> he said, Tim, I was so wrong. He said, you did this. You took such a big chance. You took a leap, gave up everything to come down here and live in this beautiful country. You met this, your, you know, this beautiful lady now who's going to be your wife. He said, I'm so sorry. I told you, you know, that you were an idiot and that you shouldn't do it. He said, the reason I told you that wasn't because of what you were doing. He said, it was because of me. He said, because I, of my own fear of doing something so bold. He said, I was talking out of my own fear. And sure. he said, I would love to do something like this. He said, but I could never do it. I could never get myself to that point where I make that leap. Mm. Right. And it, it hit home and it, and it really made sense. Right. It just, it had nothing to do with what I was doing. And that was the case for many people who had, you know, those reservations, of what I was doing. I mean, sure they cared about me and whatnot, but, Many times people have their own fear. They're talking from their own yeah. self. From it's their scary own. for you too, but like the, yeah. the real, like I went through something similar because I had the back in 2000, the end of 2010, 
I quit the six figure job that I got after I retired from the Air Force. And like, oh my goodness, everybody that knew me was like, what are you doing? The, most of them would be like, but if you quit your job, you'll lose your security clearance. And I'd be like, yay. <laughs> and they're like, <laughs> but that's your golden ticket. All, that's all you need. You will have a job forever. And I'm like, yeah, but it'll always suck. <laughs> 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 right. And so, yeah, I took that leap and you're right. Everybody says like, oh my God, I can't believe it. You're so stupid. And then my wife is just like in a panic and she's like, oh, what are we going to do? <laughs> and nobody gets you. Yeah. And then, and then you do it and nothing happens and everything's okay. And then, then they kind of look at like, look at you and, and go, oh, that was pretty neat. Look, he's okay. <laughs> he did just fine. <laughs> you know. Anyway, he survived. He survived. Yeah. Yes. I mean, you know, I didn't do anything like neat you know i i went to college i finished my degree and i went to massage school i screwed around for 10 years and then i got a job again but i'm glad uh -huh. i did all of that you know because it was a blast absolutely and <laughs> and for me you know i look at life as we, we've only got one life and i don't know if i'll be back to this life uh you know for people who, who believe in reincarnation right. you know, i don't know you can't maybe know just, and anybody that not, i, I that's I'm, just my thing you're right you're right you, you can never know you have to live as if this is it Right. And yeah. anything else is gravy. But yeah, let's just assume that this is it. I And I didn't I, live with regret. And, exactly. and it's yeah. and now looking back, I'm like, you know, I've, I've done a lot of cool stuff. I lived in a lot of great places and, and I'm just I'm glad, you know, you know, not to say that everything I've done has turned out perfectly, but yeah, you know, I'm well, glad never. I took those risks. I'm glad that I followed my dreams. I followed my passion. And, and a lot of times we just, we get drowned in, in fear and we just get this, you know, we get analysis paralysis and we're just like, I yeah. don't know what to do. I'm not happy what I'm doing, but I, I don't know. I don't have the, the, the skills, the bravery. I don't know where to go, how to improve my life or, you know. Right. I don't know do. why, but you're right. We all sort of like get, what's the word, maybe indoctrinated right through osmosis almost the yeah, yeah. culture just gets into your head like if you don't follow the path if you go off and try a thing you will die <laughs> essentially <Yeah. laughs> right and it's uh, those feelings are real they're just not true right right you right. know and another thing is taking such a big leap um, you know, moving to another country and, and throwing know, it all away is throwing thing, everything yes. away. It, right. That is not in the cards for everybody. So not everybody right. needs to do that. No. And and I think for me, and that's kind of coming back to, to coach wherever with not just the certification program, but with the, the success sessions, which are group coaching that we have is for adults who are at that point where they've achieved a level of success, but they're just, they're burned out. There's no energy. There's no excitement anymore. Right. And they don't know what to do. And so I'm giving people, you know, actionable skills to be able to show up every week with other group members. And we plan together. We set goals. We hold each other accountable. They get skills and they could get themselves out of this funk without having to just do something drastic like, you know, sell the home and, and move the family to, you know, Belize or wherever. <laughs> right. Um, right. Because it's just not in the cards for everyone. But there is a way to move out of that funk, you know, and get, right. get yourself on track where you feel alive, you feel amazing and you feel energetic. And that's what I try to do with coach wherever with the, our success sessions groups is give people the opportunity to look at all areas of their life personally and professionally and make improvements, give them the skills to be able to do that, give them the support and, and have it happen because you know, it, people don't, you know, have to make such a huge drastic change. Sure. So uh, how did you make ends meet after the big leap? Yeah. After the big leap for while I was in Costa Rica, I ended up buying some land and I sold some land. Um, and so, you know, and I, and I had some money from, you know, my house in California, right at that point, the, the real estate market was crazy. I mean, okay. the home right. was going up tremendously. Right. right. You were like, right. You sold right at pre-bubble. Right. Yeah, I was right there. And so right I had on cash the edge. Out. So you had, mm -hmm. yeah, so you made some money. Good for you. And so I bought 12 acres while I was down there. And then wow. I started messing around with, with life coaching 
Um, actually, that started in 2003. But my focus at that time was to do something different and, and try to you know do a little life coaching as well. Okay. Because I always kind of did that on the side. It was kind of my side thing, side hustle. Um, and and that's kind of you know how we lived. I mean, it's so cheap to live in Costa Rica. Uh, right. At least so at that you didn't time. need anyway. a ton of money to to make yeah. ends meet. Okay. And so I just kind of invested the money that I had. I bought you know, 12 acres up in the mountains. Um, right outside of San Jose, which is the capital of Costa Rica. And, uh, and so I ended up selling it and I, you know, I made some money there and, and, and then we came back to the States nine months later. Okay. Um, and so in 2007 I came back and then I started teaching at a university, still had coaching on the side. Okay. And, and then, um, eventually I got back into, you know, uh, working as a psychologist again, but that's kind of how I made ends meet that, you know, during that time. No, I get it. Yeah. Well, you have to do something. So, but I mean, one of the big things about going to Costa Rica, like you said, is that just falls into the category of the reduce expenses kind of thing, which <laughs> I'm, I'm all in favor of. That's why I'm in Vegas <laughs> because uh, we lived, uh, my, my wife really, really is in love with everything about Southern California, particularly yeah. areas of, uh, Los Angeles, um, because she's from Japan and like, uh, that area is like one of the biggest Japanese populations outside of Hawaii in the States. So sure. you've got grocery stores, you've got uh, like, it's uh, like, it's a miniature Japan, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so if, yeah, everything's right. There. Yeah. Everything's there. So she can go there and get her books and her groceries and her whatever, you know? So I was like, you know, California is great. I just don't want it to be my tax home. Yeah. <laughs> so Vegas turned out to be the amazing, better alternative, you know, because mm -hmm. it's only four or four and a half hours away. And suddenly you don't have to pay all those damn taxes. So, oh, yeah. I mean, I, <laughs> I, I, and I, it's just even comparing, you know, California real estate to South Carolina. Oh, gosh. Uh, oh, you know, yeah, a home. Right. A hundred thousand dollar home here in South Carolina is going for you know six, seven, eight hundred thousand in right in California. Yeah, it's nuts. And you know the taxes and the regulations and everything. It's just uh, I was always getting busted for watering my grass on the days I shouldn't be <laughs> using my fireplace when it wasn't my right. you know, <laughs> my time, my day of the week. And I'm like, this is crazy. Yeah, you know, and and thinking back to when I grew up here in South Carolina. If I wanted to take a tire and light it on fire in, in the middle of my yard, no one would say a thing. I could do that. <laughs> you know, I could send toxic fumes up into the air and not one person would say anything. Wow. I go to California. I can't even water my darn grass. Yeah. I can't, I can't even put a fire log in my fireplace without my neighbors calling, you know, the 911. <laughs> it's I'm like, this is too much. I, I, don't get me wrong. I do. I love California. I love the weather. Yeah. I love the, the mountains. I love surfing there. I just, and I love the proximity to. It's a great place you know, going to visit. Yeah. To Nevada, you know, driving across the desert, you know, from California to Las Vegas at night is one of the best things I've ever done. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. It's, it's awesome. It, like I said, you know, that it's a great place. I just don't want my tax home there. You know, I don't yeah. want, I, <laughs> I'll visit, I'll, you know, spend lots of time there. Uh, you know, it's a great place to Airbnb for, you know, extended periods of time, just not permanent residents, you know? Well, that's what I told my wife. I'm like, well, you know, I can, you know, we, well, the money we're saving here in South Carolina, we can fly to California and take a couple trips a year. And yeah. Fact, you know, exactly. we go to Costa Rica, you know, we try to go every year and, and, you know, take a trip. And, and so it's, it's fun. It's nice to have a little, you know, a little extra income and you could do those things and, and visit those places that, um, you know, may not be able to, if you lived in a high. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. It's this just reducing expenses, you know, mm -hmm. that's, that's, uh, I think step one for a lot of people when they're, when they're thinking about making some sort of change, uh, that is probably what I would put first, you know, is like, do you really need, you know, at a certain point, more stuff doesn't make you happy, more happy. That's there's, it. It's you know, like you a can't, fallacy, you know, that is so true because here it is. When I went to Costa Rica, I had sold or given away all my yeah, stuff. You don't have all that right, stuff was exactly. gone, and I was the happiest. You were ecstatic. <laughs> right. I was able to. I don't know if you ever saw that saw that show MythBusters, where they would. I love that show. Yes, that was one of my favorite shows too. You know, and they would go and the one of the favorites was 
you know, can you get the, the gasoline when you're pumping static electricity to, to catch it on fire? You know, and they can right. never get it. Right, right, right. right. Crazy. <laughs> I, so, I love that one. That was one but, of my favorites. But the myth of, you know, you need stuff, stuff is going to make you happy. I busted that because I had nothing, you know, it's, mm. it didn't have any cars at home. And I was as happy as I've ever been. Mm-hmm. And then the other myth that I busted was that Mondays is always about depression and Fridays is always about, you know, excitement and energy. <laughs> When, right. when I was there in Costa Rica and, you know, and just doing my thing every Monday, it, actually every day of the week was like Friday here. I, and I lost okay. track of what day it was. So <laughs> I get it. So Mondays yeah. is not, you know, filled with just doom and gloom. Um, and that was something that I was also happy to get away from. <laughs> right, right, right. At that time. Yeah. I actually learned that lesson when I was in the Air Force because, um, you know, you move a lot. Right. So every time. You know, the first couple of times I moved, it didn't matter because I was a kid and I didn't really have anything. But like once you get to the point where like stuff starts clinging to you, you know, oh, you've got a wife and she's buying stuff all the time. Right. And you're filling a house on every base. Um, but I started noticing like and this was like I noticed it like a little bit, but it didn't really sink in like this sort of like this idea of as you're going through the process of leaving one base to move to another base, there's this sort of like slow reduction of the number of keys you have in your pocket, (laughs) right? (laughs) Oh, I sold a car. Now I have one less key. I sold the other car and now I have one less key. And then finally at the end, you, you know, you know, you, you don't have a house anymore. All your stuff is gone. It's been put in a bunch of crates and you're moving into temporary lodging until you leave and you give away your last key and you're like, I'm homeless for a month or two. <laughs> and it just felt amazing. <laughs> Liberating. It is. Sure. It, yeah. Yeah. Now all that stuff is going to crash upon you when, when you get to your next base. But for those, <laughs> you know, I got the, I got a taste of what it felt like to not have anything. It was, it's actually right. very liberating. Like you said. Yes, it is. Yeah. Okay. So now let's see here. Where are we in the story of Tim's life? So basically when so we come back. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. So you're, are you still teaching full time at this college? Yeah. Well, and that's kind of something that I really enjoy about the field is that, you know, I'm able to do many different things. Um, you know, I, I work as a contract psychologist a little bit. I work, um, I teach graduate level courses, um, and I don't teach full time just every now and then, you right. know, maybe well, that's, a which couple is nice. of courses. Yeah. Yeah. A year. Um, I have my, you know, coach wherever, uh, you know, site and, and business going. Um, and then I do the, I work with professional and amateur athletes in the sport of motocross. Um, and so I, I have that as, as well. And so that, that keeps me busy and, and I enjoy having the flexibility to be able to do many different things because I do get bored easy. And so sure. that's one of the great things. And, um, you know, in teaching at the university is, it, you know, that was just a real joy. And, and it also looking back, you know, at my background is going in high school, you know, especially when, you know, I was someone who no one ever would ever have thought right, would, right. would become, right. you know, an instructor, you know, uh, let alone, a, you know, a college instructor or a graduate instructor. Nobody, mm. you know, everyone would have, would have now, bet the farm against <clears throat> me that it wouldn't happen. Do you ever teach undergrads or did you ever teach I have undergrad? taught, yes. Okay. Uh-huh. At that I've, level? All right. Mm-hmm. So Every did, now and then they will have you, an undergrad. Uh, opportunity come up where they have a course that someone can't fill. And so I'll jump in and, and, and do that. And, I, I and bet it's a, you it's have a, like a sympathy for those kids that are struggling. I do. And, yeah. and I always share my, right. my personal story. You know, I, 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 when I go into a classroom, I make it challenging enough to where the students who already know what they're doing are going to get their money's worth. And then I also try to reach the ones that I know that are just kind of barely hanging on. Right. You know, they're, they're just going from class to class, just barely making it. And, and I really I, I try to find Tim in every class because right. there usually is one. So I find myself, you know, and then I reach out and I help those students. And and when I get the feedback from them, you know, years later and they go, you know, you taught me so much. You know, I learned from, from your stories, I learned from your patience and I learned from, you know, the skills that you taught us. Um, and, and when they thank you, it's much, it, that is payment worth more than, than anything monetary. It, it's a great feeling. Oh yeah. 
That's amazing. So let's talk a little bit more about uh, as we wrap up. So how can people best get in touch with Tim Laskus? And uh, anything else you want to say uh, uh, before you leave? Yeah, for sure. Well, they can um, email me at tim at coachwherever.com. Nice. Okay. Or they can go to the website, coachwherever.com. And again, I have a life coach certification program. I have the mental performance coach certifi- certification program. And then I have the success sessions, which is our group coaching program. It's a monthly program. We meet uh, on Zoom. So it's you can be anywhere in the world and join. I have a variety of times from the morning to, to late evening. And uh, one time a week for an hour, we, we jump on there. And we go to work and, and then we have a different topic every month. And so every month for 12 months is a different topic and everybody sets goals for that topic, whether it's um, a personal goal or a financial goal, whether it's losing weight mm. or whether it's following their passion, changing jobs, you name it. And, and every person gets to decide that for themselves. And we w- they have the support from the group and they have the skills and strategy that I provide. And so it's just a wonderful uh, you know, avenue for people to be able to get out of that funk and not have to just throw everything away to start over from scratch. They, they can <laughs> right. slowly make change. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and so for anybody out there, you know, who feels like, Hey, you know, you've, you've achieved a certain level of success, but now you're just overwhelmed. You know, you're not happy. The, and the what's next people. Yeah. Right? And the yeah. what's next. Right. Sure. Maybe so you, we, you, we you've get, figured out like a lot of stuff. You got a big pile of money. You're getting close to retirement, but you're like, what am I going to do? <laughs> there, there, you need something to do. I mean, take yes. it from me and probably from Tim. Screwing around full time is no fun. No, no, <laughs> it it's boring it's really not, quick. Yeah. You know, and I, I was bored within the first couple of weeks because I, I tried to do that. Just do yeah, nothing too. for the first couple of weeks in Costa Rica. And I was just like, what? There's no way I got to get out. I was just full right. of energy and ready to do something. Right. And, and you so, know, surfing is not as fulfilling as one might think. Yeah. I mean, I, I love surfing, but you know, there has to be something you, you have to follow your passion in, in life. Right. And, and, and it gives you something to live for. It gives you something to be hopeful for because once, once we lose that, once we don't have anything to live for and we're not, we're, serving we're not hopeful, people. we're hopeless. Not, right. You're not you know, working, life's over. Right. That's yeah, it. You're right. You're done. Yes, and and I, and I don't and I don't believe that you know age is any indicator of what you should or should not be doing. Right. You know, if you, I think you know Colonel Sanders when he started Kentucky Fried Chicken was what in his seventies. I mean, he really? Was wow. Up there, That's he amazing. was maybe in his sixties. I mean, he was pretty old. So, you know, there are no limits. We we set our own limits, and probably the the one thing that you know I'd like to leave your listeners with is that, you, you know, your past does not equal your future. Your future equals what you do today. Right. Because if I would let my past, my past, you know, if that was the case, my past of being a failure in, you know, in high school and and almost, you know, flunking out. I mean, I should have been a a trash can man, you know, collecting trash on the side of the road, picking up cans. Sure. So your past, you have to people have to get over that. Forget about, you know, what breaks you didn't get, what happened in the past. You weren't this, you weren't that. None of that matters. What matters is what you do today. And if you start making changes today you can create that future that you want. You can create yeah. that, that fear that, that takes you on to that next journey. That's amazing. That's exciting. And that just puts you can life find back your own here. Costa Rica. <laughs> you can find your own Costa Rica. Yes. I love that. That's your book, by the way, <laughs> that is my book. Find your Costa Rica, that's five right. powerful steps to personal, professional and financial success. And there's, a, there's several steps in there and tips of what I used, you know, in order to, to achieve my goals. Right. And so, Again, I'm a teacher. I love to help people, and that's just an extension of that. This has been a blast, Tim. I appreciate you uh, spending a t- some time with me. Thank you very much, uh, Jeff. It's been a pleasure. It's been a lot of fun. Thanks. Have a good one. Too. Thanks for taking the time to ride along with us on another episode of Vroom Vroom Veer. For podcast info and show notes, be sure to head over to vvveer.com. That's triple V double E R.com. Man, that's fun to say. And we'll catch up with you next time here on Vroom Vroom Veer. Vroom Vroom Veer.